whatever lies before me. Let me be singing when the evening comes. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul. Worship his holy name. Sing like never before, O oh my soul. I'll worship your holy name. Be seated, please. I'm going to go ahead and say what all the parents were thinking when Steve was praying. In Jesus' name, amen. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> that was absolute, I'm sorry. I, think, I really think God has a sense of humor, and I think God was looking down on all the babies crying. <laughs> Steve tried to pray. <laughs> that was awesome. <laughs> Oh, I've actually cut some stuff out of the sermon, okay? So, I mean, hey. So, I was up hanging with my peeps in the balcony because I was slumming up there today because there wasn't any place to sit down here. And so I realized, man, we're going to be long today, so I cut some stuff out, so we're okay. Here's the thing. If, they say that if you were to take all the statisticians in the world and lay them end to end, that would be a good thing, Okay. So I thought we'd start with some stats today. All right, here's a, a graphic of Madison County, um, and we're gonna we're gonna call that our neighborhood. Madison County is the neighborhood for Twickenham Church. About 350,000 people live in the neighborhood, according to the U.S. Census. 28% of them are under the age of 18. That's 98,000 kids under 18 in our neighborhood, a lot of kids, okay? That's the neighborhood. Here's Huntsville city limits. Um, we're gonna call that our front yard. Madison County's the neighborhood, Huntsville city limits is our front yard. About 188,000 people live here, 27% of those are under the age of 18. That's just over 50,000 kids under the age of 18 in our front yard. Okay, let's zoom in a little tighter. Here is uh, the recently renovated Whitesburg Elementary School, which is uh, about a driver for me if I hit the pavement with the ball going that way, real close. They uh, enroll, I think, around 1,000 kids. And then here's an artist's rendition of Grissom High School. They will enroll around 2,000 kids or more. And we're gonna call those two nearby schools our front porch. It's about 3,000 kids on the front porch. And then there's us, Twickenham Church. We have about 644 active members, and if we all showed up at the same time, I'm not sure where you'd put us all, but that's what's on roll. 27% of our church, just like the county, is under the age of 18. That's 177 kids in the house. So given all those stats, all those numbers, I think here's some really relevant questions for us. How many of the 98,000 children in our neighborhood will become Christians? And maybe a more sobering question is, how many won't? How many of the 177 children in our house will still be going to church when they are adults. And how many of the 18 children we just saw will still be going to church when they're adults? And how many won't? One more question. How do we grow these children into the image of Christ? Or put another way, which is what we've been talking about lately, how do we make all the kids in the neighborhood, the 98,000 in the neighborhood, the 50,000 in the front yard, the 3,000 on the front porch, the 177 children in the house, how do we make them disciples of Jesus? We've been spending some time in Matthew chapters 28, 19, and 20, actually a little before that, 16 through 20. This morning I want to look at a different passage because I think it can help us answer the question, how do we reach out to all these kids and how do we help make all these children disciples of Jesus? 
when they're old enough to make that decision for themselves. There's a very remarkable passage that addresses that in Luke chapter 2. You want to go ahead and turn over there with me, Luke chapter 2. Matthew, Mark, Luke, third book in the New Testament, third of the Gospels, Luke chapter 2. I say this is a remarkable passage because it is the only passage in the entire Bible that talks about Jesus' childhood. Two of the Gospels talk about his birth. All of the Gospels talk about him as an adult and his crucifixion and his resurrection. This is the only passage in all the Bible, in all of the inspired Word of God that deals with Jesus as a child. And verse 52 of Luke chapter 2 covers 18 years of Jesus' life. 18 years in one verse. So what happened in those 18 years? Jesus grew. He grew in all the ways we want our kids and the other 98,000 children in the neighborhood to grow in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and with people. He grew intellectually, physically, socially, and spiritually. So let's hear the passage. I'll begin in verse 41, Luke chapter 2, verse 41. You ready? Here we go. Every year, every year, Jesus' parents went to Jerusalem for the festival of the Passover. When he was 12 years old, they went up to the festival according to the custom. After the festival was over, while his parents were returning home, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, but they were unaware of it. Thinking that he was in their company, they traveled for a day. Then they began looking for him among their relatives and friends. When they did not find him, they went back to Jerusalem to look for him. After three days, you ever lost a kid? It's a horrible feeling. After three days, they found him in the temple courts, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. Everyone who heard him was amazed at his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were astonished. His mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. Why were you searching for me, he answered. Didn't you know that I had to be in my father's house? But they did not understand what he was saying to them. Then he went home to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them. But his mother treasured all these things in her heart. And Jesus grew in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and people. Okay, I, wanna, I just want to get right to this. The first four words in the passage tell us the primary reason Jesus grew. Every year, Jesus' parents went to Jerusalem for the festival of the Passover. I, I have no doubt that celebrating the Passover was influential in Jesus' life. I mean, the, the, the annual reminder, the annual celebration of God delivering Israel out of Egyptian slavery. That had to have some influence in his life, but that was not the most influential thing. The powerful influence were his parents. Here's the deal. If we want our kids to grow up to be like Jesus, if we want our kids to be disciples, people who apprentice themselves to Jesus, then we don't need to focus first on their commitment. We parents need to focus first on ours. God cast this compelling vision for his people in Jeremiah chapter 32, verses 28, uh, 38 and 39. He says, they will be my people, and I will be their God. I will give them one heart and one way that they may fear me always for their own good, look, look at what it says next, for their own good and for the good of their children after them. Children are blessed with good when the adults in their lives live faithfully before God. Apparently, Joseph and Mary caught that vision from God every year and in every other way that we know of, they followed through on their personal responsibilities to live their lives God's way. There's a great story way back in the Old Testament, uh, uh, and I'll bet Joseph and Mary knew this story. Uh, it's in Joshua chapter 4. The Israelites are about to begin their conquest of the Promised Land, but the Jordan River is standing between them and their objective, and it was at flood stage. When I was looking at this for the last couple of weeks, I, I was thinking about what the river looked like out my back door at flood stage. 
intimidating. Impressive, but intimidating. And they're standing there wondering how they're going to get across. As soon as the priests carrying the Ark of the Covenant stepped into the Jordan River, the waters piled up, the Bible says, in a heap upstream. And then the children of Israel were able to walk across on dry ground. Now, that's not the cool part. Here's the cool part. Joshua chapter uh, 4, verse 2. God tells Joshua, choose 12 men, that's one from each tribe, 12 men from among the people, one from each tribe, and tell them to take up 12 stones from the middle of the Jordan, from right where the priests are standing, and carry them over with you and put them down at the place where you stay tonight. So God wants them to take stones from the, the riverbed that they walk across, take those stones out of the Jordan River, take them over here to uh, when, they, when they go to the other side and build a monument. Why would God want them to build a monument to the miracle? Look at verse 6. In the future, God is always looking that way. In the future, when your children ask you, what do these stones mean? Tell them that the flow of the Jordan was cut off before the Ark of the Covenant. Okay, you, you know how some things can get kind of lost in translation when you move from one language to the other? You ever notice that? Years ago, Pepsi came out with this really hip, cool slogan, come alive with the Pepsi generation, and they put it on all their cans and all their, their marketing, which was a great slogan, except in Taiwan. There it came out is, Pepsi will bring your ancestors back from the dead. <laughs> Not a good slogan. Something like that happens with verse 6. Most English versions put uh, Joshua chapter 2, verse 6 this way. When your children ask, what do these stones mean? There's a nuance in the Hebrew, though, and it changes things dramatically. In the Hebrew, what, what's really going on here is the question is, what do these stones mean to you? And there's a huge difference between those two questions. The answer to the question, as it stands in most of our English Bibles, what do these stones mean, is academic. You can get that from a book. The answer to the question in the original language, what do these stones mean to you, is personal. You can only get that from a believer. God is telling us, I think, that if this doesn't mean much to you, then why would you expect it to mean much to your children? Every time they're around us, they are asking that same question in a thousand different ways. What does it mean to you? They're not going to quote Joshua chapter 4, verse 6, but they're asking the question. They're asking it with their eyes, and we answer with our actions. We answer with our priorities. We answer with how we spend our time and how we spend our money and how we spend our energy and what we do with our talents and how we use our words. If we worship joyfully and love each other faithfully and obey God radically, we are answering, this means everything to us. They ask with their eyes. We answer with our actions. And so as Jesus watched Mary and Joseph, and I, I will guarantee you he watched, their actions answered his questions. But there's, there's something else here in this passage. Very subtle. Along with all the other ways they fulfilled their commitments, they traveled to Jerusalem for the feast, they obeyed the commands as best they could, they made it a point to take Jesus with them. They included him in their commitment. Right about here, I, if, if I were you, I'd be thinking, well, of course it, it went great with them. I mean, it's Mary and Joseph and Jesus, for crying out loud, he was perfect. How could they not do a good job raising Jesus? It was, it, it's kind of like we think that the Jesus, Joseph, Mary family is kind of like the Cleavers and the Nelsons and the Waltons on steroids, like the perfect family. Look at verse 48. I just want to show you something here, verse 48. They've been on this long road trip with relatives. Have you ever been on a long road trip with relatives? Okay. Did you keep your faith all the way through? No, you did not. They've been on this long road trip with relatives in verse 48, and they think Jesus is with them. So right off the bat, right at the beginning here, 
you've got a teenager who's not where you think he is. And then when they find him, Mary says, why have you treated us like this? Teenagers are in the balcony today. They get pushed out by all the kids and families down here. Teenagers, if your mother ever puts you on a guilt trip, Jesus understands, okay? She says, why have you treated us like this? And then look at verse 50. It says that his parents did not understand what he was saying to them. I don't know about you, but that sounds like a really normal family to me. I'll tell you one way they were absolutely normal. The primary job of raising their son in the nurture and admonition of the Lord was theirs. It was Joseph's and Mary's. Now, we can help. The church can help parents raise their kids. Parents are the most influential people in a child's life, and the responsibility to make them disciples starts in your home, but the church can help. And let me, let me tell you three quick ways that we can do that. Number one, the church, this is all of us here, we can partner with parents to reinforce what they are telling and showing their children at home. We just pledged that a second ago that we would do exactly that. We didn't raise our hands, but we stood up and we said the words that we would partner with these parents to help them. I can remember a number of times when, it, when adults partnered with my parents to help raise me. Little moments that nobody would ever remember, but I didn't forget. October 10, 1969, I went forward to be baptized at the Duluth Church. A man named Skinny Oliver went back to the prep room to help me get ready. I do not know why they called him Skinny. He wasn't. But he went back there with me, and as, as he helped me get ready, he said, this is a day you will never forget, and his voice shook. That little statement, just that one little gesture, seared that moment into my memory. Or the time our little church fielded a Bible Bowl team. A man named Charles Pledge, who was our preacher at the time, drilled a, a group of us kids over and over and over for weeks on end in the book of Matthew. We were real underdogs because the East Point Church on the other side of town had won the Bible Bowl every year since the War of Northern Aggression, <laughs> which is what we call it in Atlanta. That year, we whipped their sorry rear ends in, the, in Christian love all the way because Charles Pledge helped us. There was Louise Oswald who helped me prepare my first sermon when I was about 10 years old. Mary Jones who taught me Sunday school and hosted Easter egg hunts at her house. Those adults partnered with my parents to help raise me. We can do that. You can do that. You can partner with these parents in a lot of different ways. Volunteering in Sunday school and nursery, doing everything you can to help back up everything these parents are saying. Second, we can, we can pray for these kids. We can pray for them. Pray for the 98,000 kids in our neighborhood and the 177 who are here in the house. Pray that God will protect them from the evil one and that their parents will raise them in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Pray for them by name and tell them that you're praying for them. It will weird out our teenagers if you'll go by and say, I prayed for you by name today. It'll weird them out and they'll never forget it. They'll never forget it. Partner with these parents, pray for these kids. And here's the third way. We can pay. You and I, as the church, can pay for the tools that, that we need to help support these parents disciple their children. What, why does what you give on Sunday make a difference? Right here is why what you give on Sunday makes a difference. 18 little faces. And then, and then the other 20 or 30 teenagers up there, every, a part of every dollar we give here goes to provide tools to help these parents raise these kids in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. What, one of the things, I had not really talked to a lot of people about this yet, but one of the things I think we're going to have to look at in the not too distant future is our children's facilities. They, they've served us well for many decades. But there have been a lot of innovations and improvements in the way churches do children's ministry. We probably need to begin thinking about whether our current children's facility actually facilitates or frustrates our mission. 
just something to think about. The culture in which Jesus grew up was not conducive to spiritual growth. During his childhood, the Jews subjected, were subjected to the yoke of a foreign oppressor. He lived in a remote and conquered province of the Roman Empire. He came from an insignificant town. He grew up in poverty. He lived in the obscurity of a carpenter's shop far away from universities, academies, libraries, and yet he grew in wisdom and, in, and physically and in favor with God and with people. How did that happen? It started in his home. His parents focused first on their own commitment. It always starts there. Amy and her team, Jesse and Shelby and their team can do a lot, but nothing can take the place of committed parents. Jesus grew also because of all the other committed adults in his life, and that's how it will happen with our kids and with us. Mom and dad and the rest of us in the community working together to raise up a new generation of disciples. No matter how big a mess our culture becomes, no matter how unconducive to spiritual growth it is, no matter how spiritually concophonous it becomes, we have 98,000 reasons to do all we can to help our young ones grow in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and with people. Let's close with a prayer and then we'll sing a, another song. Let's, let's bow together. Let's go ahead and stand, if you will. God, we love you. We're so thankful for stories like this one from Luke that put us in touch with Jesus' family to remind us that there was something normal about it, in some ways a lot like ours. God, we lift up, again, the, the 18 little ones that we prayed for earlier this morning. We pray for all of those who have already been through this and are now five and six and seven. We pray for our teens in the balcony. We ask you to bless all our kids. God, we recognize that it is so hard to be a kid, a teen in this culture because this culture is hard on children. It's hard on them spiritually. It's hard on them philosophically. It's hard on them in some ways physically, hard on them mentally. So help our homes to be havens. Help our parents to be committed disciples. Help this church be willing to do everything we can to partner with, to pray for, and pay for everything that we need to support these parents in raising their children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And God, help us realize that that commitment starts with each one of us let each one of us right now think about all the reasons we have to be committed to you and then to follow through on that. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship his holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul, how worship your holy the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship his holy name, sing like never before, oh my soul, I'll worship your holy name. If you remain standing for just a minute. And let me close out with some details. First of all, we're really, really glad that you were here this morning. Thanks, all the families and guests who came. We really appreciate you guys coming to support your family. These things, 39ers, you have a day trip to yesterday's event center on Thursday, February the 25th. Sign-ups are in the adult ed lobby and details are in the bulletin. TYM Feast, our youth group invites our senior members to a dinner every year. That is on February the 12th this year at 5 o'clock. 
it's always a great night of food and fellowship. And this year, you're encouraged to wear pajamas because they're having breakfast. Okay? Not mandatory, but encouraged. 5.30, I apologize. For two reasons. One, we don't want to eliminate anybody, and we're not sure what Jim Van sleeps in. So... Ladies, you have a Spa Devo coming up on February the 8th at 10 a.m. or Thursday, February the 11th at 6 in the Mercy Building. Um, it's a special time of pampering and devotional, and so you can check out uh, or email ladies at twickenham.org uh, to sign up for that. The TCM lock-in will be Friday, February the 19th for grades 2 to 5. All the details are in your bulletin, and you can contact Amy Smith if you'd like to attend. And next Sunday night is our monthly spring service, so make sure... And mark on your calendar, 5 o'clock. Hey, listen, great morning. Amen. Praise God for all the blessings, all these babies, all these families. And we hope you have an outstanding day today. Let's close in prayer. That's some good preaching today, Jody. Thanks for that. Uh, just quickly to the parents of the teens up there in the balcony. Uh, one Sunday when I was home from college, uh, I hadn't shaved and we were getting ready for church. And my grandmother uh, told me, uh, Michael, you need to go and shave. And I said, but, but Grandma, Jesus had a beard. And without a heartbeat, she, she turned around and said, and when you start acting like him, you can look like him. So don't let them give you some kind of guilt trip about Jesus got grounded too or something like that. <clears throat> wow, 18 kids. Holy mackerel. Uh, for those that are, that are visitors, please come back again. Uh, we want you. Uh, we want our, our church numbers to increase, but if you don't, we're, we're increasing them by ourselves. In Lincoln, it's not the water. It's more of like what Joel prayed about. It's the creation process that we're blessed with. That's a joy to take part in. But anyway, uh, let's pray. God, I thank you for today. I thank you for your word. I thank you for the preacher that you've blessed us with. I thank you for this community, God, because Angelique and I need them to raise our children and God, I thank you for those that are, that are earnest and truthful with their struggles and with their experiences to help us to, to persevere through our struggles and, and our, our experiences in raising children and in living this life, Lord. And I just ask uh, that you bring us together to bear one another's burdens, Lord, so that we can glorify you in all that we do. In this your name we pray. Amen.